So this month's round tables, uh, we had a couple opportunities. This one is the power of story led by Todd, uh, special guest Sasha. Uh, they dove into the utilization of storytelling in kind of the environment and the industry that we live in and always excited to hear what you guys have to say. So turning it over to Todd. So I'm not going to be able to do it justice in this, uh, this short time here, but we started off talking about the hero's guide and how you are not the hero of your story, but the person that you're telling the story should be the hero of the story. And what does that mean? How do you position yourself as a guide or the helper? Uh, and, you know, kind of unpacking what that means. And then how do you learn from your audience to really get a gauge on their challenges, the frictions, the failures? And in order to be able to tell a compelling story, you have to know who you're telling it to what they, what makes them tick? What words do they want to hear? What, uh, you know, are they goal motivated or are they uh, motivated by moving away from something and, and avoiding something? So uh, having all that is super important to tell them the story. Sasha had some really great lines about the, the painkiller effect and recognizing the, the things that we do, the workarounds that we've created that we've just become numb to and how do you overcome that? How do you bring in the authenticity that really is going to shine through of don't try to bury your head in the sand and try to bury the, the facts that everybody is, is well acquainted with. Be open about it, share about it. That's where the story is really going to come into play is when you have a narrative that can talk to the pain points that somebody is experiencing Sounds good. Welcome, everybody. This is exciting to be in the general session for <laughs> this topic. This is my first time in the, the general session, so I feel, uh, I feel very honored. I, I think it's all, all you, Shasta. So, so super excited for our, our subject matter expert on storytelling today is somebody who needs no introduction. Uh, Sasha Reed is, is here with us, uh, Director of Industry Advancement at Procore, and she's going to be sharing her insights and experiences in leveraging amazing stories and how to change mindsets uh, in those stories. So really looking forward to unpacking. We have some, some really cool tidbits and, and insights to share in with that. Sasha, while I start pinning everybody uh, on the, the round table, you wanna give a, a quick little kind of summary uh, before we get started in storytelling? Sure, sure. I I'm excited to see so many <laughs> of you in the room. I had anticipated like, I don't know how many are really gonna be super interested in storytelling when we're talking about digital twins. Um, but I'm very excited to see those of you in the room and I'm glad we're recording this that hopefully people can join in and uh, watch this on demand. Um, I haven't really considered myself a subject matter expert in the realm of storytelling, but um, when I actually look back at my career, I recognize that majority of uh, what I was doing was storytelling. So if you also feel like you uh, may not be the type of person who does storytelling for your day job, you're in the right room. I just wanna start there. <laughs> I think it's important to note that every part of our interactions, whether they are at business with um, trying to get uh, buy-in on an idea that you have, trying to work across departments on moving an idea forward, um, whether it's trying to get someone to buy your product or someone internally to buy the product you think will work best for your team, whichever role you sit in, um, storytelling is a very powerful way of connecting with another um, human being in order to create alignment and to um, influence outcomes. And that's across the board. So I'm excited today to, to jump into this with Todd. And Todd also has a ton of experience in this realm. So I think we'll kind of be co-presenting together because I'm looking for his input as well. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to it. So 
let's do a quick kind of round the horn, see who's all in the room. And if you guys can just give a, a quick, you know, one sentence line, who you are, where you're coming from, and why you wanted to, to sit in this room. That would be awesome. And Rob, you are first on my screen. So we're going to start with you. I'm uh, Rob Slayer. I'm um, living, work in Southeast Florida, specifically West Palm Beach. I work for uh, Cass Construction and uh, why storytelling. Um, I guess all of us that have been involved in construction technology to one degree or another are, are selling something, <laughs> even if we're not working for a, a, a software company or whatever, we're still selling things internally. Sometimes we're bringing fire to the cavemen. Um, so I think I've, I've kind of had a relatively recent epiphany that at, at the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to explain to people what the value in the, in the change is for them and stories is a, a good way to do that. Rob, I, I love that you brought that up because that was one of the things Sasha and I talked about when we were planning this out and we are going to be getting into that, all the different stories that are out there and the different types of stories that you can tell. So uh, excited to, to hear your, your input on that. Bianca, we're coming to you next. Oh, thanks, Todd. Um, so I'm Bianca Corey. I'm the construction technology manager with Eagle Point Software. And, um, you know, today's session really excites me. Um, one, you know, Sasha and Todd are just very in inspiring people and creative individuals. And um, to Rob's last point, um, you know, in construction tech, I think, you know, there's often like the analytics and um, the ability to um, convey the importance of tech. And so sometimes the, 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 the creative vein is what really kind of pumps throughout like all of our day to day and um, just how to understand those, um, you know, various hurdles that we kind of have to overcome. And what are some of like the ways we can equip ourselves to, you know, continue forward. Um, so I'm just, I'm really excited to hear everyone's perspective on, and like, you know, with some of these main challenges that we all re can relate to. So <laughs> thanks, Todd. Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. Rachel, let's go over to you. Hi, I'm Rachel Ferreira. I'm the system admin for our document control system at Zachary Construction. And as system admin, I'm having to develop business processes in our system and then sell them to our end users, get them to utilize and embrace a new process that, you know, change is always difficult. And so being able to tell the story about the best way to do it really does help get people on board. Yeah, definitely. Emily. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Emily. I'm the strategic development manager at Dato. We're a construction tech company as well. Um, I'm also here because just like Bianca, I'm a huge Todd fan, a huge Sasha fan. So I knew this was going to be a great discussion. And, um, you know, at a young company, Dato is now three years old this month. Storytelling is a really amazing way for us to create connections and be able to better understand, you know, our place in the industry and how we can um, better, better serve our, you know, our connections. So this is a great, great discussion and hoping to, to learn a lot today. Cool. Welcome. All right, Jonathan. Uh, I'm Jonathan Marsh. I'm with Still Toe Consulting. And um, I just, I have to do a lot of discovery on businesses that I don't know anything about. And I, I found that one of the best ways to do that is to get them to start telling stories. And I actually got like systematic about it at some point, because if you have them tell you actual stories, you get better information. And um, I started using the hero's quest as sort of like the outline for the story and even have like a bunch of execs that are part of Nika's innovation group going around in like using the hero's quest model to kind of do stories, to gather stories up, um, to look at for doing like a big process map. Um, but anyways, I was walking with my wife the other day and um, she said, wow, did you ever, do you know about the heroine's quest? Um, because it's a different story arc and it's a story arc that's closer to what happens in construction where we work together and we kind of build teams to accomplish our goals. So hearing that, I realized that I actually don't know a lot about story and narrative. Um, and I probably could use listening to some people that really spend a lot of time in it, like Todd, that, that can really help me to maybe, maybe eke out better stories from the people I'm talking to. 
um, rather than tell the better story, just kind of get them to share the better story. So I'm not learning what they want me to know about their business, but how their business actually kind of works. That's awesome. You guys are setting us up perfect for where we're going today. I love this. Eric, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Ubri, the Director of Technology and Innovation for Arco Marine National Construction. Um, I'm a pretty strong believer that a lot of the challenges our industry is centered around communication and education and empathy. And I think um, what better way to touch all three of those than through a good story. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to hear from Sasha and Todd, as excited as everyone else. I'm happy to hear uh, and, and uh, learn from you. Cool. Awesome. Well, welcome. And last but not least, Darshi, is that how you say it? Um, yes, it's Darshid. Um, so, hey, everyone. Um, I work with Eric Hubri as well at Argo Marie's um, Innovation and Technology Group. Um, and I am very interested in this session because, again, I believe that stories are a very good way to connect with a very diverse group of people, which we do as part of the innovation team, wherein we are talking with people from the field. We are talking with the C-suite people as well as the innovators in the industry. So I think stories are a very effective way of doing that. So interested in improving my skills with that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Excited to have you all and unpack this. Feel free. We want to make it really interactive too and, and hear from you. Uh, and so stop us along the way with any questions or if you don't want to come off mute, you can put them in the chat. I'll be having that up and, and looking at that as well too. Uh, Sasha, I, I think a great place to to start really. Let's, what it makes a good story to you? Let's kind of define what we're talking about here with story. Yeah, and I, I'm so glad that Jonathan talked about this, the hero's journey. And it's, you know, Joseph Campbell's model on the hero's journey is what I would consider to be the holy grail of storytelling um, and really understanding the, the mechanisms and the constructs of this type of story. I think it, the mechanics of it is really important. Um, to anyone who has any role that you have to either convey ideas, build consensus and get in somebody to take action or to change their mind. I think this is a, a very important model um, to look at and to know and to understand. Um, but when I think about on a personal level, what really makes a good story for me personally, I think what's most satisfying about a really good story is that energy that comes when you can strip down a character to their most authentic elements, um, really exposing their flaws essentially, and then getting to see them succeed or triumph in spite of their flaws. So whether we're talking about uh, a movie, a documentary, a short story, an animation, um, or even if you're considering doing a business pitch, I think something we all crave to see is authenticity. And again, it, it reflects back to the hero's journey and this idea of um, uh, some wanting to see some representative of ourselves, flaws and all, in an overcoming story, a success story. Um, I actually had the chance, the pleasure of interviewing Mike Rowe for Procore's Groundbreak Conference in 2019. And he had just finished writing a book called The Way I Heard It, which is a book that accompanies his current podcast. And when I asked him a similar question around what are what would he consider to be the, the key elements of good storytelling, um, he had one word and that was authenticity. And he's, his words especially were around the idea of any network or content provider today is truly looking for characters with authenticity. And I think that's important for companies to understand. It's important for us as individuals to think about when we're trying to persuade someone to do something we want them to do. Um, I think it really becomes important to recognize what does that authenticity look like? How do I become my most authentic self in this conversation and, and hopefully um, really create a compelling story that somebody follows and wants to, if I'm leading, somebody wants to follow. And I, I, I really love um, Robert McKee, who is the author of a book called Storynomics. Um, I had the pleasure of attending his uh, story webinar 
or seminar in 2018, and it changed the entire way that I think about, especially from a construction technology standpoint, um, building consensus, persuading, creating a vision of a of a new a new future. And he he says or he he shares that conflict changes life. And this is kind of the universal storytelling in three words. Truly, it's it's around what is the conflict and how is that changing someone's life? And um, he he then drills down to a, a real prime definition of a dynamic escalation of conflict-driven events that causes a meaningful change in a character's life. And truly that journey is fueled by, in spite of their best efforts, um, there's a failure that occurs when we think we understand where we're going and we step out into that journey. And yet with, in spite of our best efforts, we fail because what we didn't understand is what we think something should be and what it actually is are two different things. And that element of surprise or that element of, um, in spite of my flaws, I was able to succeed uh, and I was able to uh, solve a problem in spite of myself. I think these are really the core characteristics that, um, that are the structure, the framework to, to any story especially in a post-advertising world <laughs> where advertising is all, my product is perfect and your, what you're using now is flawed. So use my product. It's, our brains are not wired to work this way. So really understanding uh, the hero's journey, I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. For those who aren't as familiar with it, can you kind of unpack what the hero's journey is and then what are the, you were speaking to it just then, but kind of break down the, the key points and maybe speak to why, how is this effective? Why is it effective? Yeah, it's um, primarily, and, and I'm Todd, I definitely want you to chime in as well because you're masterful at this also. You very much understand this. So I definitely want you to chime in. Um, but essentially uh, the hero's journey, think of um, Star Wars is probably one of the prime examples of a hero's journey. You have Luke Skywalker who just wants to shoot Oh my gosh, I can't remember. Is it wombats with his, <laughs> you know, it just wants to shoot wombats in the desert. And like, like, that's his like living his life, his like best life. But something calls him to, to, to some adventure. Something within him calls him to this greater adventure. And the ability to take your safe desert life and answer that call to an adventure and step out into that adventure um, is kind of like the start of the hero's journey. But then once you step out into this adventure, um, there's, uh, well, naturally, there's where you hit these, these roadblocks or these barriers that step in your way to what you think is this adventure that you're being called to. And you start to experience challenges. Um, and in that process of, starting to face your own failures and your challenges, you're met with your Obi-Wan Kenobi. That person, that guide, that someone who comes and shows you there's a different way. I know you have an idea of what adventure you're on, but there's potentially a different way. And a mentor or a helper is what we, we're looking at here in the model. That mentor teaches you a different way of thinking. And in, like I spoke of earlier, in spite of your flaws, allows you to work through your own flaws, work through your own frailties to discover a new way. And what you discover in this new way, as you've fought through your demons, so to speak, and you find this new way, you understand or have a revelation. Um, I think the best revelation of all was Wizard of Oz when the good Glenda the Good Witch told Dorothy, you had, my dear, you had it within you the whole time. So this idea of she had the ability to go home the whole time, but because her definition of this adventure she was on was very much focused uh, on something very different, she thought she had to get to the wizard. <laughs> And the wizard was going to be the one to bring her home. Yet what she recognizes that she had that ability all along. So that really transforms the character into this elevated state or um, this idea of um, it, it, it is truly in the letting go and truly understanding yourself that the higher path, the greater way, the way out, the light at the end of the tunnel um, is revealed and you rise above. 
And that idea of then coming back to your place or your place of origin, a transformed person. And I think this is also a very good model to think of for businesses. Um, think of the times when you first started investing in technology and you thought you had found your silver bullet and you were so excited and you deployed it. And all of a sudden, what you in your mind had thought was the perfect product with the perfect plan starts to face internal conflict, internal resistance, and you're racking your brain. Why is this happening? Why don't they see what it is I'm trying to do? And you experience that conflict. And the idea of finding those um, helpers or mentors within the company who then you can work with to find their own path with the technology. They start to have buy-in. They start to see the value what's in it for them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the shared pains, Nathan. Um, you start to create that common ground, meeting them where they're at. And all of a sudden you start to see these mini evangelists popping up within the organization who catch the vision. And all of a sudden you're no longer the only one speaking out in the desert about why this technology really needs to be a part of your process. They're taking a journey that creates its, a life of its own. And you start to see um, the technology finally start to pay off the price that pay off for itself. So this is, and this is not a one and done. This is a model for any time you step out in a new adventure, anytime you try a new initiative, this is the same model that can be applied to all of those different experiences. So when you start to think in terms of the framework for what makes a good story, it allows you to start thinking about the experience and more specifically, the challenges, the friction and the failure in a very different way, which if you look at those in different ways, you now can create a level of authenticity and representation when you think about storytelling. But Todd, I know there's there's parts and pieces I left out. I'd love to get your your feed in to this as well. Yeah, you, you did a great job explaining that. One of the things that I think is really important to understand when you're trying to grasp the hero's journey and figure out how it applies to you and where you fit in it, uh, and this has kind of become a, a pet peeve of mine, especially with companies telling stories, is you are not the hero of your story never typecast yourself as the hero of the story. Nobody cares about what you did. <laughs> I, that's a tough truth for some of you. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's, you yeah, know, honestly hurts sometimes. <laughs> uh, you are the guide. If you're the company, you want to be position yourself as the guide that comes along and helps the people figure out their journey because you have the answers, you have the solutions. Even if you're trying to figure it out, nobody wants to go to somebody that is talking all about themselves. They want to go to somebody that's going to turn around and put all the attention back on the person that they're telling the story to. And so in order to do that, you have to be the guide, not the hero. And to Sasha's point earlier of the, you know, the advertisements in today's world of making it all about their product, we are so inundated. And I am frankly very sick of, <laughs> of ads that make the product the hero. If all you're talking about is your product and, you know, picks and clicks and nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> How is it going to solve their day-to-day -day problems? How is it going to solve their challenges that they're going through, their pain points? And the only way to do that is to talk with your audience and, and figure out what they're after, what they're looking for, because the idea and conception that you have in your head is probably not exactly lined up with what they have in their head. Even if you're close, there's different shades of gray and, and nuances. And that's what makes the story so compelling when you can capture what they are really feeling in the, the right way. And you, you put that emotion into the story. That's where the, the stories that grip us are those emotional pulls, uh, just universal Agreed. kind of truth there. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, so Sasha, if, we're going to kind of turn and, and look at the audience. What are some suggestions that, that you have to get to learn more about your audience, whether it's on the software provider side, learning about their end user, or just telling the, the story of, of contact in a company to try to get more buy-in, create more champions? How do you learn more about who you're trying to tell your story to? 
Well, I think um, I think there's some fundamental rules of engagement when it comes to being a storyteller, especially um, when looking at kind of how you structure even beginning to tell a story. So even before you begin, I think there's three main questions you have to ask yourself. I still ask myself this every single time a request comes through to pull, write an article, present at a conference, do a webinar. This is the same three questions I ask myself. And those are, who is your audience? Being very clear on knowing who your audience is. What does their world look like? What are their current pain points? What's the pain that they're experiencing? And by pain, I mean, whether it's a business team structure, whatever it is that they're struggling with, um, what is their pain? Um, and getting very clearly dialed in on that. Um, and then the next question I ask myself is, what action do I want them to take? So in this conversation, there's something I'm compelling them to do, or a, in marketing, we call it a CTA. What is the call to action? Something that triggers them to take a step towards doing something. Being really clear on what that is allows you to kind of narrow in your frame of reference of the story you tell. And then the third and final question is, what behavior do you wanna change? And so being very clear on who your audience is, what action you want them to take or what behavior you want them to change, getting very, very clear on that allows you to become very specific in your storytelling and avoid some common, common mistakes, which we see a lot um, of construction actually. Speaking of common mistakes, construction is actually, um, very much guilty of this in many ways. And that's utilizing your failures as the foundation to elevate success. So, you know, Todd, you said earlier, like nobody wants to hear an advertisement about a perfect product that solves all problems. Um, likewise, think if you're a general contractor and you're trying to win work. Um, it, it, the, it, the same can be said there. I mean, think about it. Everyone knows what the problems, the biggest problems are construction over time, over budget, wasted materials and risk of human life. Like anyone you talk to about construction knows that that's the reality of construction. Yet so many times when construction firms are trying to pitch themselves to win new work, they're glossing over all those details and saying, look at how amazing our team is. Look at how great we um, look at, look at these finished projects <laughs> and if you're lucky, happy owners. Like th this, this is not a story anyone buys because everyone knows the realities and the flaws of construction. Whereas if you were to look at this and frame this differently to say, these are the pitfalls that every construction firm faces. These are the catastrophic potential risks at play if we get it wrong. Here's how our teams have learned from every mistake that we've experienced in the field to create new processes, new technologies to enable a new way to be a resilient builder in modern times. That's a story an owner would actually buy because you're reflecting to them what they already know about the construction firm, if you are, as that main character. If you're, if you're kind of looking at uh, the idea of my audience, in this case for the general contractor wanting to sell themselves a new work, that owner really getting clear on who the owner is, what is the pain they're experiencing, how do we make the owner the hero of our story and we're the, the helper who helps that owner realize their dreams and our credibility as being the helper is through how we tell the story of our resilience through learning from mistakes taking risk and converting that into intelligence. And that's where the technology players in the room really come into play here. How are you helping that general contractor learn from their mistakes, implementing technology in the processes so that they finally have data insights that they can gather from the processes so they can be that helper to bring the hero, which is the owner along on their journey. And I think the only way we get really good at this is, is curiosity and listening and, and getting really curious about, I know my world well, but I need to think of who my audience is 
and my hero is in order to understand their world equally as well. So many good takeaways that <laughs> I've been jotting down <laughs> to jump off of. Uh, I love that you brought up the believability issue because if for the, the construction firm, if you go out there and you're pitching an owner that everything's going to be great and that you're not addressing what, you know, the examples that you cited there with over time, over budget, they're not, it's not believable. They, they know that the reality is this, that you just look like you're burying your head in the sand. So you have to speak to what they know is fact. And, and that goes back to what, where you started with authenticity of really being true to where you are owning. If something's not, you know, all sunshines and rainbows, owning that, saying it, and then how are you going to address it? And that is the, where the story opportunity is. The story isn't in how well that you can do the, the total package necessarily. It's in how well are you going to overcome those shortcomings and those pains? And that's yeah. where you get the compelling it's story. Exactly. And you can even take this to an individual level. So how many of us on this call, how many of us have thought about going into a job interview and saying, let me share with you two of my biggest moments of failure and how I learn from those greatest failures in order to demonstrate what we each get from failure. The, the byproduct of failure, if you're still continuing to move forward is resilience. How have we, how, how many of us have ever thought to go into a job interview to say, as of today, the skill set you're acquiring by bringing me on board and by partnering with you is the resilience that I've learned through these very specific failures where I learned how to, how to understand and see myself better, how to lead myself to lead others better. These are things that employers look for and listen to in between the self-promoted lines of, I've done, I've driven this much revenue. I've created teams that scaled from this metric to this metric. The reality is we have to differentiate what is information sharing and what is storytelling. And a good statistic to keep in mind is um, Matthew Lunn, who is an author, storyteller, consultant. He worked with Pixar for many years on Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., uh, Ratatouille, Up, one of my favorites. He, uh, he says that my job is to make you cry, which I mean, if anyone's seen Up, then, then he's been successful. But one of the things that he shares in his talks is essentially people only remember 5% of any statistics that you share which sucks for me because I'm a data nerd and I freaking love statistics and I'm guilty. I put way too many in my presentations, but it's because sometimes my audience are also data nerds. And so I'm hoping that that 5% maybe extends to seven to 10% retention. However, when you're telling a story, your audience will retain 65% of what you told. And it's essentially because your brain receives information in different parts of your brain, whether it's informational or it's story. The moment, if I'm talking to you and I'm presenting statistics on, you know, marketing in the, the modern world, et cetera, et cetera. But let me tell you this one time I went on a job interview and I walked into that job interview and this is what I told the interviewer. The minute I use that language, the minute I shift my tone of voice, the minute I start to engage in a personal storytelling, a very different part of your brain lights up and starts interacting. And, and Nathan has, ahead of this talk, Nathan shared an amazing talk and we'll make sure you have links to everything we're, we're mentioning today, today. But there's a great TED talk um, from Yuri Hassan on the science of storytelling. And from a neuroscience perspective, when somebody is orating or telling a story, you actually, they can actually track the brain waves of all of those who are listening, where the brain waves work in flow in very simple, with very similar activity. So in the process of orating or telling a story, you're activating a very powerful part of the brain that not only can be synchronized 
to follow your experience and to feel almost a first person experience, but they will retain 65% of what you tell them in that story. This is why storytelling is so powerful and why when it's done right, especially with brands, why it has such an impact on its audience. I love that you separated the information sharing versus storytelling because uh, the thing that popped in my mind, I can remember movies that I watched when I was like six and seven years old, but what did I eat yesterday for dinner? I have no idea. Yeah, so I have to think about that, but I can tell you every single line of every single movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, going kind of circling back to knowing audience, I want to share another resource. One of a book that I've read recently that has been really amazing in kind of understanding how to get into the audience mindset is words that change minds. Mm-hmm. And we'll send a, a link to that. It's a uh, Shelly Rose Charvet. Here's the book. If you're interested in what it looks like. Uh, I keep it by my desk all the time and it, <laughs> it really breaks down all these different kind of mindsets and personality types of people. And it's, there's really fascinating book. There's a lot of like personality traits into it, but it also gets into what motivates people and how you have to adapt and shift your language based on who you're talking to. So for example, if, you know, one of the, the breakdowns that they go in the book is, is somebody driven in a towards posture, meaning they're motivated by having the goal established and they're going to run that race hard to accomplish that goal? Or are they in an away from posture, meaning that they don't really care about goals. They just don't want this to happen. And that's what they're motivated by. And so they're going to do whatever they can to avoid something happening. And that's really important in how you're going to communicate the story to that person. Because If they're an away from person and you're all about, all right, we're going to go and accomplish this. And this is going to be the goal. Here's our metrics. Here's our KPIs. They're like, I I don't care about any of that. I just don't want that to happen. Where if you go in on the the contrary of that uh, and you're into that uh, away from person and you're saying, hey, here's the story. Here's I've seen this happen before. And here's how we managed to avoid this happening. Here's the steps that we took. Here's the roadmap to it they kind of lean into it and they're going, oh yeah. And everything's kind of triggering off in their brain and they are, you know, full attention. And one of the things that is, was really interesting to me as I read this book is how honestly, I I think very differently than most of our core (laughs) audience at applied software. And that's okay. What I recognize that, that I can't think how to, Todd want to hear this story or how, how do I want to hear this information? Cause it's not about me. I'm, I'm not the hero. So I have to put myself in the position of the audience then and go, all right, I might be, I'm a, a goal person and I have that toward posture, but if my people are away from, I have to adapt my style to their needs because it's, it's not about me. So, you know, <laughs> check the, the, the ego at the door and you only know that by talking with people and having that curiosity, like you said, Shas. Yeah, there's, you know, there's so much to unpack in that idea of curiosity. Um, And I think this is something that really good storytellers, so think of some of your your favorite directors, writers, um, this is something that I think they have, which is a natural curiosity and how to get curious about your audience. Um, Brian Grazier has a wonderful book called A Curious Mind, and it's nothing more than story after story of a random time that he was sitting down with someone famous or not, and just got curious about that individual. And through his curiosity, these pathways open to a a dialogue or storytelling that leads to a kernel of an idea that eventually has become a movie that he's worked on. And I think it's such a great way for um, marketers to think in terms of, okay, I have deadlines, I have goals, I have things I need to do, but really truly getting curious about who your audience is, um, is is a really key element to making sure you're telling stories that resonate. Something that from coming from the technology side, I found was um, especially important for product marketers was really being able to understand the pain that your audience is feeling. And for technology providers, specifically construction technology providers, there's a, I would say, 
I call it the painkiller effect. There is, an, there is a hurdle you have to overcome in helping your customers to exceed and experience their pain outside of the painkillers they're currently taking. So these are things um, like processes, workarounds, Excel, and Microsoft Word are the greatest painkillers for this industry, truly. And so you have to almost be able to actively listen to your customers. And what I mean by actively listen is watch and observe when your customers are doing a specific workflow or talking through a specific workflow. Listen equally to what they say as to what they don't say. Because in what they don't say is where you find where the painkillers are the workarounds are creating a good enough experience that they aren't even aware of the true pain and cost to the organization because they're so used to doing it in that way. Um, this is another great way to overcome. That's just how we've always done it. When you look at the phrase, that's just how we've always done it as a painkiller rather than a, a fixed mindset you have to change, you have the opportunity to articulate story around that particular pain point, bringing to highlight or bringing to bear what that activity, the lack of productivity, the lack of accessibility to data in the cloud, whatever your technology is kind of solving for, articulating how that is truly impacting your business is a way to overcome some of those, the numbness that comes from workarounds and just the way we've always done it. And telling story around how that really truly impacts the business is a very powerful way to help your customer, your hero, start to overcome some of those, the numbing that, that they've done over the years to, to just get by and they're not even aware of it. This is a place where your technology and your storytelling has, has the ability to remove that numbing agent in order for them to realize, holy crap, I was only thinking of the pain I was experiencing in 16 clicks. But in reality, it's 16 clicks times 30 people times 70 projects in the life cycle of, of the projects we're delivering. And when you can start to look at how the numbing agents are hiding the waste that's within these organizations and not to mention the human impact, all of a sudden you can start to have a very different compelling conversation. Yeah, love that. One of the things that stood out too is, is listening to what they're not saying as much as what they are saying. And that's where some of those, those golden nuggets, because a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. Uh, every time they don't know what they don't know, but <laughs> uh, when the, you know, if you're coming with a particular solution in mind, they don't know what that solution is. And so listening to what they're, they're not talking about there, you can pick up little hooks and, and anchors that you can do in, in your story. That's awesome. There's three kind of main types of stories that we wanted to kind of unpack of persuasion, product demos, and brand. And so in vein of active listening, I wanted to open it up to everybody here in our round table here of which of these three stories do you guys want to dive more into? At least to start, we can tackle all three if we have time, but any one of these that kind of jump out to the majority of the group. So persuasion, really trying to seek a, a change and action in somebody changing that behavior or leaning into the, the contact side of things and how do you tell a story around your product and create a, a demo that's the most compelling that it can be, or just in brand in general. And this really could be personal or corporate brand. How do you tell a narrative about yourself, your company, a product that is compelling? I, I think from the standpoint of the three stories that you have, I think the branding one would probably be the most helpful for me at least. I mean, I'm actually a, a definitely a fourth type where my, my goal in, in the storytelling is to get them to tell me their story and bring me along with them so I can compare it to the experiences I have to help them find perhaps a better path. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do is take people that haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the stories they're telling them and kind of, I know you said, I, I should never be the hero, I completely agree. But like my goal is to make them the hero. So it becomes this first person story where you're less likely to tell, I mean, 
things get narratively true where they're not actually true. It's just for the sake of the narrative, it's pretty much true. Um, but at least you get closer. Like I had, I have people that that we are talking about what their process is in their business, and they'll they'll tell me what it is, and then I'll say, okay, tell me how that process succeeded, and make it a story, and and I'll, I'll kind of help them out by you know making them more of the hero and putting in those little pieces, and by the end of that, it's pretty clear that that's not the process that you actually use in your business, which is why it's not working. Um, it has nothing to do with anything else. You just your story has nothing to do with the process you just told me or or it's exactly right and you have somebody that you're sitting with that's super insightful that's going to be able to download to you really fast how that business functions like if i was sitting down with you with, with any of you and asking you to tell me stories i bet you i could download most of what your business does really fast especially if you do have a branding narrative and really fast, I can say, okay, so here's where what I'm seeing differs from your story, or here's where my experiences differ and where I might be able to help you as a consultant. So, I mean, if you guys would go over the brand narrative one, I think that would be the closest because that's the story I'm trying to get them to is the one where they tell me how they do things. Yeah. And, and I think the important thing there is the Simon Sinek um, quote, which is, People buy, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And when you're talking about a brand, um, it is less, much less on the mechanics of what that company does. And it's much more on why does the company exist and getting them to kind of share with you their understanding, their, the story they're telling themselves or the story they're aspiring to tell. And I think specifically coming from a consultant standpoint, this is a very wise path <laughs> of leveraging storytelling to create the need for your services and your business. The more you can get them to define what that brand is that they're sharing to the world, who they want them to be themselves to be seen as in the world, what their aspirational um, views are, the more you can through internal interviews with those within the company, get an actual representation of current state. So in their mind, their brand may represent an aspirational goal of who they wanna be. And the key here is the careful places, is the executive leadership aware that this brand is future state and they know there's work to be done or are they deluding themselves to believe they are that today and they don't have a good feedback mechanism for those who are at the business end of the work to inform them that there's a delta between the two. And for consultant storytelling, this is hugely important, specifically because there's, these are no longer your words. You listen to their narrative, their story, you report back what's the interviews you've had and the actual current state that you've documented based on their stories, their words, and then you clearly define the delta between the two as the justification to pay you to come in to help them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's that perfect. brand, that is a, a very savvy way of using brand, um, marketing a brand storytelling to help them understand, do they reflect their brand? Is it aspirational or is it supposed to be literal? And if it, if there's a disconnect with the executive team, that's your way to get us straight in. Because if your workers who are at the business end are complaining or are, are stating, you know, we're not quite there, it's not compelling enough for an, a C-suite executive to write a check. They have to be the ones to recognize, we thought this is who we are, but it's truly aspirational. Oh, crap. We need Jonathan's help. That, that, so really knowing your audience, I think that's a brilliant way of using brand. I like the aspirational versus actual. I like that a lot. That, that's a very good duality to, to look at. Can, can I ask you guys one more question before I like let you go back? Um, did you guys, have you guys thought about this as, you know, a lot of design thinking starts with storytelling. Um, when, when these products are being brought up, um, especially like, uh, I, I think, I think Emily's on here from, yeah, Emily, when, you're, when your product was started up, they actually brought me out to San Francisco uh, for design thinking. And it was how many stories of construction can you come up with, you know, in, in four hours to, to try to figure out what construction needs from software. Um, 
So have you, Todd and, and Sasha, have you guys sort of, do you guys use storytelling in a similar way to see what the real, real needs are versus what people think they are? Like the perceived pain versus the real pain? <laughs> uh, yeah. Todd, go, go ahead, you, you answer and then I'll, I'll come on the back end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, for me personally, I, I, there's kind of a, a two-pronged approach. I think on the aspirational side, on the, the podcast side of things, I'm able to get a lot of the aspirational side. And then through applied and, and talking with customers and hearing customer stories and how they're actually using it in the trenches, that's where I'm able to, to see where that, that delta of the aspirational versus reality is. Because a, a lot of times, you know, I'll, <laughs> I can get in the, the podcasting bubble of like, oh yeah, everybody's doing this now. I've had you know, 10 guests in a row that are all talking about this. And then I turn around to somebody in our, you know, on our services side, or I talk to a customer and they're like, yeah, that's, it's not really happening. I'm like, well, you know, what's going on here? And so I, that duality for me is good personally to be able to hear the aspirational side of the stories, but then also have boots on the ground. It's a, this is not a shameless plug, but it, it is one of the reasons why I love like an MVP force or going to different conferences like that. Cause you get those real world stories. Oh, so much that's better. So right, man. After, after the conference, there's the stories and, and that's, that's sort of the, the, that that's where I, I end up taking most of my knowledge from the conferences is not the, the, the prepared speech. It's the stories afterwards from people. Yeah. And, and I would even take that in a, a step further. Um, I had the opportunity uh, when I was previously, when I was with Bluebeam, I had the opportunity of working with a really stellar marketing team that was masterful at this concept around storytelling. And we together did a series, um, a C-suite series of, of interviewing uh, the CEO of Bluebeam, the CEO of our customer and showing the, 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 executive alignment that was between two men who had never met each other, but the companies fit very well together because there was a great executive alignment at the top. And trying to tell a CEO story I discovered is really hard because most CEOs are very, very good at what I call the stump speech, a prepared stump speech. It's the suit. It's the, my job is to speak high level to who our company is, what we do, the value it brings, what motivates and drives us, and what the legacy of this company will be. This is something by default, by definition, they need to be at the ready for. Um, and so when I was trying to work with the, the team to, as executive producer, to create these more human focused executive stories, I found it really difficult to get past the suit. And so we ended up as a team storyboarding in this one conference room. How are we going to get past? Because what we got is not compelling. Nobody wants to hear how your company's perfect, how you're, you thought of this your whole life, how you were, you now sit in the C-suite. It's like the 1% story. Nobody's going to want to hear this. How do we get past that? And so two things that we discovered in, in that process was if you let someone talk long enough, they will get past their stump speech. They will exhaust their internal script. They'll exhaust their talking points. And at some point they're going to be their authentic self. Also always be shooting, always be rolling. Don't tell them when you start and stop. Don't ever tell your subject because we as humans have a, especially the C-suite has a very sophisticated media savvy way of presenting themselves. And that's what makes them successful. But for compelling human stories, we actually need to see the failure, the flaw, and the acknowledgement of lesser than in, in order to really truly create the leverage that needs to be for that overcoming story. So when you're, when you're thinking about it in terms of having those conversations around, yes, this is, this, is the, this is the ideal state of what I see our company being, who we are and what we deliver, if you let some, just keep rolling, keep having a conversation, relax your body language as their interviewer, do not let them know that you have not cut 
and keep asking questions and, and telling stories. Of course, you don't want to publish anything without their permission, but you start to get the reality of who that person is on a more human level, which then can, can, can create a much more relatable, compelling story. Do, do you guys have warning signs for somebody that's going into a packaged speech? Do you guys have like things that you would say, okay, this guy's about to just download an entire marketing speech on me. I need to disrupt them. Cause both of you like have a lot, do a lot of interviews and, and that's the danger. Like I've had it happen to me on the dorks a lot, like, like halfway through and you're like, oh no, no, they're going to give me a marketing speech and this is not going to be a good story. And it's obvious, but like, what are some of the, what are some of the tactics or some of the strategies you use um, to sort of identify stories that maybe aren't, aren't as, as uh, from the heart or authentic, sorry. Warnings that this is this is an inauthentic story coming at you. I think you can see it coming a mile away. <laughs> you know, their their body language kind of changes. They they stiffen up or you know they they can straighten up some. Um, uh, I like to ask a couple. If I see that coming, uh, I, I like to ask some questions that kind of come in from left field and <laughs> throw them off their balance a little bit because it kind of jars them out of what they were thinking. Even if like in the final cut we splice it so that it follows a, a logical conversation yeah. uh, it's good in that moment to kind of just get them out of their that rut that they have found themselves in uh but then just kind of leaning in asking some open-ended questions too of like okay that's cool now how does that really help like practically what does that give the you know whatever person that they're telling the story about or um you know just trying to drill in on those open-ended because sometimes they uh -huh. Sasha's point of they, they can exhaust their talking speech. If you kind of lean into it more, ask it in a slightly different way, a lot of times they reword it, even, even if they're saying the exact same point, but they just reword it in a way that's more natural speak than their prepared remarks. That helps a lot too. Yeah. And I would, I would add that really good storytelling isn't done live really good storytelling is edited. And that's because I think we as humans are conditioned to cover and to put a mask on. We're conditioned to high performance means no flaws. I mean, we have an entire separate round table going on right now around mental health. This, the reason we have a challenge with mental health is because we put so much energy and effort into projecting perfection, strength, flawlessness. So when it comes to really good storytelling, you have to go past an evolutionary way that the brain is hardwired to protect itself in order through narrative to project itself as stronger. So I think really good storytelling is only done when there can be editing on the back end because thank God we're not using film anymore. This is digital and there's endless amounts. So to Todd's point, you can see the minute somebody, the light turns on that camera, you will see physical changes. Their pupils will dilate, their face will become flush. They'll start to bead, sweat, their breathing will become shallow. And you've got to allow that person to go through that phase. So I typically, depending on how savvy that person is, will have the target questions we as a production team have decided this is the story we want to tell. I'll have 15 other questions before that to get them through their nervousness and to have them hear them say it one way. So they've heard themselves say it. So they're not gonna repeat, ask the question just ever so slightly and hear their second take and second and third takes can, can sometimes be the better ones. And the open-ended uh, question is, is, it's a good one, but be ready for whatever they're going to bring. So if you're really trying to create a very curated narration, Posing the same question three different ways is a great way, especially for somebody who has a prepared speech and is marketing savvy or media savvy. It's a great, you'll never get this with a politician, but that's why we're not interviewing politicians. But for a leader or somebody who has a marketing speech, this is a great way to get them past the nervousness into a space where they're not in their head, but they're in their body and they're feeling what you're asking them. And it's just a matter of 
let the keep rolling, keep rolling and adjust as that person starts to, you'll see their body language shift. You'll notice their pupils become normal again. It's, it's fascinating to watch, <laughs> to watch what we as humans do when we're trying to project who we think we need to be in that moment, rather than being authentically who we are. And it, it really can't be rehearsed. I think it's also worth noting that the, in, not only to get the most authentic self from the subject, but to get the most authentic self from whoever's host or telling the story or interviewing, that you have to really be aware of your strengths and your weaknesses, and really probably more aware of your weaknesses, uh, of what do you really bring to the table? Why, are, why do you have any credibility to speak on this? And don't try to be all things to all people because you're not. I, <laughs> personally, for me, that was a thing that I, I kind of struggled with when starting Bridging the Gap a couple of years ago was I am not the uh, technical contact expert by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> and I do not claim to be. Uh, and so like, what do I, how do I speak on con construction technology and being able to be like, figure out where's my voice in this? What can I do? how can I position this? I don't have to be the expert in order to tell different stories about it and just ask people what they think about it and get their opinions on it. Uh, and then that, that took a lot of pressure off. And so I think being able to know this is my role, this is my niche, here's who I am and be truthful to your yeah. subject and to your audience about it. And to Darshit's point, you asked about persuasion. You're like, hey, I'm curious about persuasion. I think this, there's also a thread that goes through that as well. I think, and, and Todd, I do want your, your input as well, but I think one of the greatest ways to persuade is to first start with creating common ground. You have to find a place of common ground. And I often find similar to negotiations, go into a negotiation knowing exactly who your target, what do they care about and what do they want? Leading by saying, hey, I want to talk to you about this upcoming partnership. I understand clearly that you want this. I can give you this. That brings you here. Bringing that forward in the first five minutes of a conversation or of a, a dialogue or storytelling, giving them that right up front, I equate it to the mental, um, this, the similar mental model of what you learn in self-defense class. So as a woman, if you're carrying a purse, someone comes to snatch your purse, the worst thing you can do is to pull with force away from the purse snatcher because they're coming at you with all this energy in the opposite direction to grab your purse. What you want to do is use that energy to your advantage. So actually you have to train yourself to overcome your instincts when they grab your purse to push in the direction they're pulling to get them off of balance and get them kind of on their back like, oh crap, I wasn't expecting that. Same thing can be done with persuasion. This is why knowing your audience is so important, being very curious about who they are, hearing what they say, what they don't say. If you can kind of lead into that storytelling that gives them that payoff up front, leads to what it is you're trying to persuade, you all of a sudden have removed some of those barriers of the resistance because they were expecting to be sold, but instead what you were doing was reflecting to them what you've heard and understood that's almost unexpected. So it creates almost this disarming moment of, wow, yeah, that's exactly what I'm, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> and that, that in, in and of itself, there's one, one way of doing that um, very brass tacks. I remember when we were going to trade shows and training people to be on the, the show floor to demonstrate the product. And as I was observing the team, I was noticing they were getting 15 minutes of talking before the person who came to look at the technology asked a question, got a word in edgewise, and we just don't have that time when you're on the trade show floor. So one of the things that we talked about as a team was before you show them a single functionality, ask them, so tell me a bit about the work you do. What kind of work do you do? What kind of trouble are you experiencing? Why did you come to the booth? What are you looking for? And sometimes you'll get someone who's an architect and like, well, I just want to see what you want to do. But if you get somebody from construction, they're like, oh, thanks for asking. I'm struggling with, with you know, document control and how do I get my head wrapped around this? And they'll spew their pain out to you right at the open part. And you're like, great, that means I need to show them this 10% of the product. 
which is exactly what they want and exactly what they need and get straight to the heart of, of what they need. But in order to persuade, you have to be very, very, very well aware of who your audience is and what they want. Does that help, Darshit? Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I also had a very um, spe specific question as well. So we previously talked about sometimes people have developed numbness to some of the painkillers just because they have been doing things in a particular way. So how do you go past that and get them stimulated to uh, be even open to consider what you are pitching? So in this, I'll use an example for direct dialogue. So I would even use this as part of your discovery to understand who your audience is you keep asking, and how does that impact X? So what are you currently using today? Oh, we're currently using this, this, and this. Great, how is that working for you? Well, it's working fine. Okay, how is the, um, how is this differ from your optimal idea? Well, you know, our optimal idea is this, but you know, we're okay here. Well, well and you literally want to ask them five additional questions that get them to go a little bit further. And this is a very well-known sales model, but it applies even here. Um, you want them to go beyond the, the, the numbing agent to actually get them to have to articulate, well, I haven't really thought of how the fact, why the fact that we take, we have six different software systems that require our people to go in and out of six different interfaces and that cognitive switching, I've never tallied the cost of that. Great. That means we have some learning and discovery to do together in order to understand where the where you're where you're leaking productivity, where your teams are creating friction that's unnecessary, et cetera. The, the path to get there is really through don't give up. And it's called dragging them through the glass. When, if they're, if they, if you're, if you're, if they're like, oh, I'm going to walk on the glass. It's like, great. Let's walk on that again. Let's go again. How, why, what asking these questions causes them to go one level deeper into really getting past that numbing agent to understand. I haven't, haven't calculated. For instance, I don't think we've calculated the cost of human lives to have been working in construction for so many years solving problems through shouting matches in the field. I've had conversations with grown men in their 50s who have so much anxiety, lack of sleep, their family lives are in turmoil because that's just how we do it. Whoever yells the most is the one who wins that outcome. We're not actually looking at insights, but it's not until you step back and continue to ask those questions that these individuals in the midst of it stop and say, I haven't calculated the cost. That's when you have them. That's when you can really start to look at what is the pain they're feeling. That's, That's awesome. Pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things that stood out to me in that last few minutes is if you show up and you start telling your story before the other person mm -hmm. is speaking, you are telling the wrong story. You need to shut up. <laughs> ask a question, let them tell their story. And then you can tell the right story that they're wanting to hear. Who's your audience? And that's, that can be done in two minutes at a demo booth or in, you know, two weeks with the production team doing a, a piece, a discovery, you know, a discovery storytelling documentary piece on a partner, a customer, et cetera. It, it, it's the same mechanics. The timeline is just a little bit different. Here's a question for the group. This might be too uh, too big to unpack, but why do we think construction seems to kind of struggle sharing their success stories? Maybe what are some of the, the stumbling blocks? So I don't know if I don't know if construction struggles with with telling their success stories. I just don't think they're telling them right. Hmm. It's the emperor has no clothes, right? So everyone understands and knows the, the, con the constraints around construction and what makes it such a difficult uh, exercise or enterprise because of all the different players. And so without being able to clearly articulate the risk, the danger, the, the failure or the, the, um, the chance for failure, that, that large kind of object without being able to clearly articulate that, your success will not be as shining or as compelling as it could be. 
it's almost like scale. You need to have the weight of the potential risk that you as a business leader or contractor are carrying in this endeavor, yet you're, when you eke out creating standard operating procedures that allows the RFI process, the RFP process, the punch process to be consistently conducted, and then that becomes true data that can then be pulled for insights, analytics and insights, that doesn't sound sexy and exciting if you can't create a reality of what it's like without that or what's at risk. And so I think this is inherently where a lot of construction firms struggle to tell their success stories is because they have to recognize the emperor with no clothes. You have to acknowledge and admit that piece that is the risk, your opposition to your success. And you have to clearly articulate that. Just my opinion, but. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Looks like all of our friends are back now too. <laughs> I, well, and Sasha, I feel like for the next one, we're going to have to combine mental health uh, and and thought, thought leadership around like who, which personality type are you telling the story to? Is it your, your Myers-Briggs intuitive that's just tell me a story and say, sure, yeah, that's that's fine. I, I just need to hear the story versus the more uh, the S side of it that uh, needs to see the data that needs to, that's more sensing that needs to kind of feel it and, and get their hands around it. And so what is that story that speaks to both of them? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> for next time, for next time. 